This document is dated January 6, 1866, and it's a labor contract. Right. Now, we've searched post-Civil War labor contracts up and down, looking right. for as many as we could for every guest in our series. And this is the only one that we've ever found. The only one. The said Jesse Carey, on his part, promises to furnish the above-named freedmen land to cultivate the farming tools, mm -hmm. the horses, the mules. Mm -hmm. And we, the above-named freedmen, mm -hmm. on our part, promises to cultivate sufficient grain for the use of the family and stock the balance in cotton. Right. Oh, I hate it. The cotton field, because mm -hmm. there were those hairy worms crawling, there were the spiders, and, and also the picking of the cotton. I couldn't quite get as much in my sack as everybody else. Mm -hmm. and everyone was picking and pushing it down, and their sacks were really full, and I really wanted that. How old were you when you started? Oh, you know, I don't really remember, but what you do remember is the... Oh. The cones, the, the, your hands and the cuticles, yeah. and, and the sun. The sun was so hot. Hmm. Well, Tina, this document lays out the terms by which your great-great-grandfather Logan and his family would barter their labor with the white man named Jesse Curry, the same man who had owned them before the Civil War ended. Yes. So they didn't leave. They stayed, but they struck up a deal with them. Yes. An arrangement, as you know, that came to be called sharecropping. Yes. Mm -hmm. The relationship between Logan Curry and his former master changed dramatically. Instead of owner and property, they were now employer and employee, an important step towards genuine equality. We searched the records to see what else we could find out about Logan Curry. I solemnized mm -hmm. the right of matrimony between the within named parties on the 27th day of December, 1870. And look who signed it. Logan Curry, M.G. Minister of the Gospel. Ah. Uh -huh. It seems that your great-great-grandfather, Logan, had become a minister. Between the year 1870, five years after slavery ended, uh -huh. and 1888, Logan Curry married more than 50 black couples. Okay. As soon as slavery ended, one of the first thing black people did was they sought out a minister and a, the courthouse yes. to legalize their relationships, which hadn't been legal under slavery. And your great-great-grandfather, Logan, was one of the people sanctioning the uh, institution of marriage. This is great information. Really great. Marriage was not only an act of love and commitment. It was also an opportunity for the former slaves to exercise their new rights as citizens. But some families still bore the scars of slavery, especially those that cross racial lines. Do you consider Alfred Carr part of your family? Sure. He's my great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather. That's There's right. no getting around that. No. Is there any way to get around that? No. Nope. Actor Morgan Freeman is fascinated by his family history. He's traced his ancestry all the way back to his great-great-grandmother, Celie Johnson, who was black, and his great-great-grandfather, Alfred Carr, who was white. We wondered if Celie Johnson had been a victim of sexual exploitation, like so many other black women back then. So we were surprised to see that the 1870 census for Mississippi shows Celie Johnson and her eight children living with Alfred Carr five years after the end of slavery. Going back even further, what else could records tell us about Seely and Alfred? Well, we looked at the 1860 census for Atala County. Alfred was 60. He was laboring on a farm. Value of personal estate was $2,000, and he was born in North Carolina. Now, if you look two lines up, you mm -hmm. can see the head of household, in other words, the farm owner for whom Alfred Carr Work. It says Mr. Andrew Johnson. And this same Johnson family owned your great-great-grandmother, Celie Johnson. So your great-great-grandfather was working for the Johnson family and living on their farm. And Morgan having children with one of their slaves. Which meant that any and all children that she bore were his. Were their property as well. Mm -hmm. 
How does it make you feel? Well, I don't know, really. Alfred Carr just stood by while Seely Johnson and their eight children were held in slavery for years. Why did she end up living with this man once she was free? We went to Itala County to examine the records. What we found was a revelation about Seely and about her family's relationship to Alfred. We discovered that in 1869, Alfred okay, Carr, Carr purchased property with James, his eldest son, with Seely. Is that right? Then a year later, Al Carr sells the same piece of land to James and to three of his brothers. And when you were growing up, did your family ever? Not ever, one word. Not one word. Now, it would be certainly surprising if four very young men who had been slaves had the sum of $1,500 just five years after emancipation. OK. Well, according to Mississippi law, illegitimate children could not inherit property from their fathers. It may be this was a way for Alfred Carr to provide for Seely and their mixed children. Really? Well, we went to the land that Alfred bought and sold to his sons 140 years ago. And look what we found. Would you mind turning the page of the scrapbook to 18? Morgan, whatever the nature of their relationship, whatever it may have been during slavery times, your great-great-grandparents decided they would be buried side by side on the old car land surrounded by the graves of their children. And it's still there. It's, as a Friday brother, it was still there. When we look back at the records, we figured out that Celia and Alfred had been together for about 35 years by the time that Alfred died in 1882. Maybe that's why the person who made these headstones called her Seely Carr. Whatever her reasons may have been, Morgan's great-great-grandmother defied custom by living with this white man. Maybe this was the most important part of being free. Finally, Seely and all the other former slaves could make choices of their own. What stories did you hear about your great-grandfather, William McAlpine, when you were growing up? I, I hate to say it, but my mother really didn't talk all that much about him. Hmm. I know that she was from a very prominent family, but not much conversation there. Soon after Linda Johnson Rice's great-grandfather, William McAlpine, got his freedom, he became a Baptist minister. But he had even greater aspirations beyond leading a church. This is a page from 1873, the Colored Baptists of Alabama, Alabama the state convention. Reverend W.H. McAlpine introduced the following. Resolved that we plant in the state of Alabama a theological school to educate our young men. 1873, Linda, slavery just ended 1865. Eight years later, this brother has the audacity to introduce this resolution. Okay, would you read the next part? The White Baptist Convention assembled in the same city at the same time advised against the educational scheme, of course. <laughs> Why do you say of course? Black people, intelligent, coming together as a group, strength in numbers, oh no. Terrifying. Oh, how are we going to control them? Even the church at that time, which recognized black people had souls, even the church did not want black people to be autonomous. You know, the Lord don't want you all to be too free yet. Mm-mm. You're out of our control. That's not what we want. Blacks came out of slavery, not a lump of clay, but they came out of slavery with definite ideas. 